but you know, what I want to do first is kind of a level set with the group and talk big picture about carbon, carbon programs, what's important from the buyer perspective. And I can't emphasize that enough. If no one's willing to buy that carbon credit or that data asset, have you really built the right thing? Have you really done the right thing on your farm or participated in the right program? So we'll get into that. Um, so let's talk about technology first. We've got a climate crisis. There is all kinds of things being made by the Fortune 500 companies to say, by 2030, we're gonna do this within our supply chains. We're gonna reduce carbon. We're gonna reduce energy. We need a technology today to help them in that transition. So there's all kinds of announcements about carbon sequestration in um, what we call direct air capture methods, where you're pulling carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere, pumping it underground, storing it in rock formations, or con converting it into a solid form in the ground. There's a lot of news around one up in Iceland that was recently launched. $1,000 a credit for sequestering in a rock formation. In one county in Illinois, you could sequester 10 times what that did with just partial adoption of some of these carbon practices. So the, the scale of what agriculture can bring to this is enormous. And the technology that agriculture can bring is photosynthesis. It's plants. It's a technology of today. We don't have to do anything different. We just have to approach agriculture differently and here's the result. Right? This is a side-by-side -side across the road from one, a field that's been in cover cropping and no tillage for a number of years, a field on the left that was in conventional, same soil. There's the carbon, came out of the air, into the ground. That's the goal, that's what photosynthesis does. Now, what we do at Indigo is we quantify that. We put a number to that. We prove to the farmer and the landowner that produced it we prove it to the buyer that that invisible gas was pulled out of the atmosphere, converted into something in the soil that's quantified and that you can get paid for. That's the long and the short of it. That's a carbon program. So currently, and I'm talking currently, there are five agricultural practices that can uh, develop carbon-rich soils. Planting cover crops, which we've just talked about, reducing tillage, well, if you've got a cover crop going, there's going to be less tillage. So that one comes along hand in hand. Rotations, thinking about different rotations. There's interesting things coming out with uh, the cover crest group and thinking about double cropping, wheat, soy, um, other interesting options with crop rotations that we all ought to be thinking about. Rebalancing inputs. I don't like to use reducing inputs because that's not right. If your yield's going up, Fertilizer rates, in some cases, have to go up to be more sustainable. That's not a problem. Rebalancing them, the timing of inputs, all of those are very important. And then the last one, incorporating livestock. For some of you, that will make sense, incorporating livestock. Where I am in Champaign County, Illinois, that infrastructure was torn out 20 years ago. It's not there. So the reality of incorporating livestock in some areas of the country is not real. In other areas, it could be. But I think what this points to, and what I'm trying to say is there's a, there's a menu of options to get you to be able to participate in a carbon program. Not all of them are right everywhere. Combinations of them sequester more carbon. At least one of these is needed to qualify you into a program. Okay. So big picture, how does this work? You got landowners, growers, and their trusted partners. We've announced partnerships with Corteva, with uh, ag retailers like Growmark, and a host of others across the industry to work with us. We're trying to reach farmers and reach landowners where they already interact, the relationships that we have. We announced recently um, some work with um, Compeer on the financial side. So again, we're, we're trying not to increase the effort that it takes to interact and, oh, another salesperson, another conversation, another tool. We're really trying to keep that as integrated as possible across the ecosystem and the way you're already working. All right, we sit in the middle between the landowners, growers, and the partners, and the buyers. We work with the registries. The registries are the rulemaking bodies. 
They're the ones that set the standard for what the buyers say they want. Okay. I don't set the rules. The Indigo program is there to administer those rules to the buyer specifications so that there's value back through the chain. All right? And the way we do that financially, 75% of the credit goes to the farmer and landowner. The trusted advisors and Indigo split the remaining 25% of that. But it's 100% of the effort going there. What I like to say there is we have aligned economics. Indigo is sitting on the same side of the table as the farmer in this. You make more carbon per acre, we share in that revenue with you. That's the incentive. That's the alignment that keeps everyone honest in this piece. That's, that's another thing to think about in a carbon program is really think hard about the group. What are their economic incentives? Why are they talking to you about carbon? And um, ultimately, are they the long-term partner? One of the things, this is not, um, carbon programs aren't something to get into for a year and go, well, that was fun. Let me try a different one. Once you do these new practices, they're now in your baseline and they won't count going forward. So to get into it, you gotta get into it right. You gotta get into a program that's flexible, that gives you the options of the way in which this industry will move. Carbon and carbon credits are a big part of it. You may have heard about ecosystem services, you may have heard about low carbon fuels, biodiesel others, scope three emissions where you're doing an actual program directly with a buyer of that grain and trying to prove that, I'll give you an example, make it tangible. Uh, Post, the cereal brand, Post. My kids eat Cocoa Pebbles, they, they love Post. But um, Post came up with a new brand called Airly, and Airly's a snack cracker. It's like a Ritz cracker kind of thing. And it's actually a carbon negative cracker. You can go on Amazon and buy it right now, and every cracker you eat, you're shoving carbon into the ground. That's kind of cool. So they're, they're, they're coming up with a whole brand and approach to try to make sure that um, we can look across this whole range. So you can see any, anywhere from a carbon credit, which is basically creating a, a vehicle for the transfer of that carbon to someone else's uh, financial reporting. And it doesn't have to be an ag. It could be FedEx, it could be Delta Airlines, it could be an aluminum smelter importing into Europe. Those are the customers of carbon credits. They don't have to be tied to agriculture at all. All the way through to that early example where they are working with the farmers, accounting for the complete, was my tractor tier four emissions? Am I doing this the right way? Reducing that carbon footprint so that they can make a claim on that box of crackers that you're buying on Amazon, for example. Okay. So all that's happening. So we're, we're fitting in the middle. That's how the economics work out. Um, the buyers, are saying we want the registry and Indigo's there to make sure that all that happens. Okay, so I like talking about these four points because it's critical to understand these if you really want to understand carbon. And they're not complicated, they're new words. Realness, additionality, permanence, and leakage. And they don't mean what you think. <laughs> they're all different from what you think. Realness, all right, maybe realness is real. It's gotta be real. Like this is an invisible, gas that you are pulling out of the atmosphere and shoving into the ground, all right? In order for that to be real, we have to prove that it's conservative and that it's modeled. So what Indigo's done is gone out and invested in technology. We recently acquired a company called Soil Metrics. It was run by a, and, it, and he's part of our team now, Keith Poshin, he's a Nobel laureate, um, has published this, paper, this model that he has called Dacent over 30,000 times, so academia has accepted this as real, as a real model, that's realness. We're, we're proving that these carbon credits are real throughout the process, that has, that's one of the tenets of this. Additionality, we talked a little about that. That's the cover cropping, that's the no-till, that's the new thing. You have to do something additional that you weren't already doing, because what you're already doing is already in the atmosphere, right? That already happened. So in order for a company to say, we looked at agriculture, they made a change, and we're compensating them for that change, you have to actually do the change. Now this is, this is a big point of contention. When I, I don't know if any here, classic no-till farmers who've been doing it for 15, 20 years. 
what are you going to do? You're already doing cover crops. You're already, what, this program might not be for you. I've got a way, and we're working on a way, to pull the classic regenerative no-till farmers along for the ride on this. There's a way to do it. And I'm thinking about you and really trying to make that happen. Additionality is a challenge. Now, when I talk to the long-term regenerative farmers, they say, well, I'm doing everything. It's like, oh, you're doing everything that you're willing to do. And I'm not going to argue with you that that's not everything that you're willing to do. And that's, there's probably something, though, that could still get you into a carbon program and still get you on that chain of working with us and getting used to this, getting used to this new farm of growing called carbon farming. All right, so that's additionality. So you have to actually do something different this year. Permanence means it's got to stick around. If you do something different and the next year you come in and undo it, did you actually do anything for the atmosphere? All that carbon dioxide came back out. It didn't stay. All right. So the permanence piece means you not only have to do something new, but you got to stick with it for a number of years. And the way we do that is we break the payments out for the credits, where in the first year, there's a 50% payment. In year two, it's 20. In year three, it's 10, 10, 10 out in those years. So we're spreading out the payments of the carbon credits for both the additionality that happens in year one and then the permanence of keeping it around. Now, these payments come each year. Every year that you participate in a carbon program and you continue the additionality, you only have to meet that criteria in the first year. Then you're eligible for 10 years of that same thing. So you add a cover crop for the first time, you got 10 years before you have to do a multi-species cover crop or add something new. And we're looking at a pipeline of new companies and new technologies to be able to actually um, make sure there's something new for you always through this in time. All right, so that's additionality and permanence. They're together. And those are the big points of why we need a registry, why we need a registry approved method, and why the buyers of carbon credits are looking to those registry approved tools like the Indigo Carbon Program because we are doing the additionality and permanence, the two things that make a carbon credit real. The realness is our accounting of it, writing it down in the documentation. That's what proves the realness. That's the quality assurance. The additionality and permanence is a big piece. All right, the fourth one is leakage. The best way to explain this is from where it, where it started. It started in forest carbon programs. And the worry there was there was encroachment on the edge of a forest from logging or something else. That was leakage. The carbon was supposed to be in the program, and it leaked out somehow. It leaked out into the atmosphere. It leaked out into the world. So that's where the term comes from. In agriculture, for us, it means if you inadvertently reduce your yields trying to participate in a carbon program. Say you're producing 200 bushel corn. You're like, well, I'm going to put down half the nitrogen. I'm going to get a bunch of money for carbon. And your yield's now 120 bushels. That 80 bushel difference has to be made up somewhere else. That leaked away because that benefit to society was that you were producing 200 bushels year after year after year on that land. So by reducing it to 120 and trying to get some carbon dollars, you've undone it in the other way. So that's a checkpoint against keeping everybody honest, saying, look, the whole point is for you, your primary job as farmers to produce the primary crop, to have it, to grow it, try to do some changes, to participate in a carbon program, do better, discover a better way of doing agriculture along the way, great, right? But not letting it leak out by just saying, oh, I'll just, I just won't grow corn, I'll, I'll grow a grass here instead. You've leaked away you've leaked away all the benefit of having the actual crop there, and it doesn't count. Another area, it's not really in the US, but in Brazil is a big one. Um, if the field was a rainforest any time in the last 15 years, it doesn't qualify. Right? You can't burn down a rainforest, grow corn, and get a carbon credit. So it's about one atmosphere. It's about a global effort for one atmosphere right? and some change. OK, so how we work with growers, landowners, and trusted partners, it's an eight-step process. Sign up, or you got to sign up. Sign up means that you've committed that acre into a program, and that sets us up to do a random soil sample of it. So any of the enrolled acres become eligible. We go out. Farmers never pay to participate in the Indigo Carbon Program. The soil sampling is something we do as part of our quantification. That's our end. That's our job. That's what we're doing. That's our 25% of this thing. So grower signs up, come up with a plan. So you're working with your trusted advisor, agronomist. Um, in the case of Corteva, it's the pioneer seed rep. 
um, or they have a, a group of agronomists. If it's grow markets, the retail agronomists, you're out there working with a planning group to figure out what that change, then you actually gotta make the change. So if you're gonna put out a cover crop for the first time, you gotta do it. You gotta actually make it. And then you have to go the full year, right? And have that change happen. At harvest of your primary crop is the end of the cycle. There's a real harvest that you have and there's a digital harvest. So this is the digital twin. You might have heard that term, digital twin. I saw it upstairs on some of the booths. That's a term that's sticking. A digital twin means that you can sequester carbon for real in your field by doing a cover crop, by doing no-till. But if you don't write it all down and put it in a program, we can't pay you for it. You gotta prove it, right? Because it's invisible. <laughs> no one can see it. You gotta prove it. You gotta put it all together into the program. And in our digital twin, we have to be able to represent that. If we can represent it, we can pay you for it. That's the point. All right, um, so we're involved with that digital harvest. Then our, in gray here, are the three things that Indigo focuses on as a core. Other groups have called it MRV, Measurement Reporting Verification Technology. But we test the soil, about 10% of the acres in our program. We do a soil sample down. We do a dry combustion method of looking at actual carbon and a soil bulk density measurement to make sure um, that we're spot checking the models. The rest of it's modeled with the technology from soil metrics. We then verify and issue the credits from the registry. We work with the registry. We do the submission as a group. We find the buyers right now. Right now there's no carbon market for these. We are actively pushing this. So we came to market. We were the first ones to do this. We came to the market with 20 bucks. And we came to the market with 20 because forest credits were selling for five. So we said, well, let's 4X it. That sounds like a good number to start. So we came to the market with 20. Um, we sold out. Right? Had a whole team going out and talking to all kinds of buyers. Sold out immediately. Overbooked. So I raised the prices to 27. Sold out. You know. So we, <laughs> let me ask this question. Who here wants to make less money with carbon? No, nobody, right? And, and I think we're aligned. Indigo makes more, farmer makes more, landowner makes more if we're able to produce more and we're able to get a better price for them. So on our side right now, in a very early market, we're making sure there are buyers behind the credits. And we're, we're actively going out and working with them in always not so much of a convivial way. You know, in a lot of deals, we, we blow up as a result of saying, nope, we're not gonna sell those credits for $10. There's, that's, yeah, we'd find some farmers who might be interested at a credit at $10, but we're not gonna do that to the industry. The price has to go up. Now, all indications are that the price will end up in the 60, 70, $80 a ton. And if we work that back, what that means, roughly a half a ton to one ton is the potential per acre per year. So we get into that cost of production. If you're doing a cover crop, cover crop seed, termination chemistry, new equipment financing for no-till, you're in that $40, $40 range like we heard this morning upstairs. So we get above that and then it becomes a, uh, a pure economic viable um, approach to carbon. Right now there's side benefits. I see uh, Mitchell Horrors here in the audience. Mitchell is uh, doing all sorts of work with regenerative, regenerative agriculture. There are benefits of this agriculture to the land. I would argue in increased value of the land for all the reasons we think of with uh, soil carbon and uh, soil organic matter increase and just the, um, the benefits of, of a healthier soil and its resilience, its absorbance capacity where you're using the soil as the absorbance to uh, risk and change as opposed to additional nitrogen fertilizers, for example. All right, that's the selling carbon. The last one is getting paid. That's a big one. Everybody wants to get paid. Um, we have a system set up to do that. We issued first payments from our first carbon credit cohort. 2020 was the first carbon crop. Um, farmers were paid September, early September this year. Um, for a first tranche, there'll be additional payments that'll come out as those credits are verified and issued um, into uh, early this year. All right, so that's, that's the paid part. Now, when, when we think of of getting paid, you know, one, one of the things I'm really interested in this audience, and I'll just ask for a show of hands here, so warning you, and I ask you to raise your hand, think about this. How do you think uh, carbon credits should shake out, landowner versus farmer? And I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you think about that for a second. 
early participants in our program were owner operators. Because in our contract, there's a contract. It's a five year contract to sign up for Indigo. Others have 10, 15, 20 year contracts. I would argue a long term contract's maybe even better for you. You might want to be thinking about that. Um, we went from 10 years to five. People responded to that well. Um, and we think that by setting up and having success by year three, by four, farmer landowners will sign up for another round and a longer range contract. But it's a contract, nonetheless. Um, so of those payments, how much do you think landowners should get? How much do you think the farmer should get? 50-50. I heard that from the audience. All right, 50-50, that's a crop share. If, if we were in a crop share situation, I think if you were splitting costs straight up the middle between landowner brings the land, farmer brings the operating equipment, split the inputs, split the fuel, that's one way. Anybody have any other ideas? Well, I'll tell you right now, the um, cost of production could be higher. So one of the one of the suggestions, and, and I'm just interested to see head nodding and other thoughts here, um, is that we start to think about um, giving the farmer, the operator, a chance to get their feet under them and try this, because there is an advantage to the land of um, increased value over time as a result of the change in practices. All right, so it's new. Prices are uncertain. We're sure prices are going up for carbon credits year after year. We've proven that. The key is getting the operator to make the change. That's a big deal, right? To change, to go away from something their parents and grandparents may have done on the land, to make that change, to, to, to switch over on equipment, to make that change. That's a big deal. All right, so I, I'm, I'm uh, advocating at first to work it out, figure out figure out what's fair, but make sure the growers get going on it. You know, they're having to assert in our contract that they have control of the land. All right, that's the control provision. I don't, I don't, we don't prove, we don't want to get in between the relationship either. I don't have the time for that, to get in the relationship between the landowner and the farmer. I need this group to work that out and come together jointly and decide that carbon farming is for them and that it's good for the land and it's good for the economics and there's an opportunity in carbon farming that's being added. All right, so with that, I've got another mic here and for the, for the folks that are online, um, just kind of pass around the mic here if anyone has questions. I'd like to answer your questions about, about carbon, carbon farming and programs overall. Uh, yeah. Sorry. From data you've gathered, um, what percentage of producers are carbon neutral before they enter the program, or are they deficit carbon-wise? So of the... Um, the vast majority that have entered in were the first time doing cover crops and the first time even thinking about no-till. So they are very much at a, at a carbon deficit in terms of an industry-wide production of, of, uh, of food and fiber and fuel. There is a, a societal um, assessment or acceptance that agriculture is a, a, a very, as, a, as an industry, is a net carbon emitter, right? So all these changes are reducing the overall footprint of agriculture. What we're saying as society is we need agriculture. We need to feed people. We need the products from agriculture. That's not going to change. So that's, that's the justification for it. I guess my, what that leads me to is that if everybody, if the initiative is that everybody is carbon neutral and if most of agriculture that's going to get paid carbon credits is net negative, are they going to have to use some of what they're doing to get neutral before they could sell anything at some point in time? Because, again, it's almost like deficit spending. Um, if you're 
creating a program where you provide carbon credits to an industry that's that's in a deficit from an industry that's in a deficit. So anyway, just trying to understand yeah, no, that. Uh, it's, it's a great question. And, and one of the things, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in a kind of roundabout way, but come around it from a different direction. The buyers of carbon credits today, I hope, are not the buyers of carbon credits in the future. So what this is, this is a technology, like I explained in the beginning, photosynthesis. It's something today that we can tangibly put at the problem and say, we increase photosynthesis, we can sequester more carbon today, we make that change today. That helps companies achieve their goals. And then they buy more fuel efficient forklifts and somebody comes up with electric jets. You know, we gotta let that technology happen that doesn't exist today. So with the technology in agriculture photosynthesis, you're able to go and say, one atmosphere, big picture. If we can today change agriculture from a, a a net emitter of carbon to even slightly less of an emitter of carbon. That's a measurable change to our overall atmosphere. We can apply that to other industries that help them in that transition. But by driving the price of carbon credits up, there's two things. Not only do farmers want the price up, the higher the price of carbon credit goes, the more likely that industry is going to be to turn over to something that's a lower carbon emitting um, product overall, right? They'll actually try to do the change and, and improve. So a little of this is you know, supply demand economics. We'll, we'll get to a point where this is above the cost of production, there's a healthy profit margin in it for farmers, but it's painful enough that people go and buy more fuel efficient forklifts at, uh, at an Amazon warehouse, for example. You know, that's, that's all coming. Oh, wait, hold. well, I, here, I just, I want to make sure the people online can hear the question or they won't be able to hear the question, so. So, two questions. What's the size of the market in the future? I mean, it'd be easy to sign up with certain groups, 100, 200, 500,000 acres. So, what is the size? And second of all, in some areas of the country, they don't do much of any of this. So if it's 10 years, should I implement cover crops, do that for 10 years, and then implement tillage practices after that so I have another 10 years? Or is it something you want to do everything possible at the beginning? Great question. So do we want to do everything possible at the beginning? Um, you can certainly stack. So if it makes sense, and you're not gonna have a failure. I'm, I'm more worried about someone going all in on all acres with so much change and then having a problem with their primary crop. I wanna make sure farmers are first being responsible you know, about this and not making too much change. So if you can do multiple changes, there's no reason to wait. The only reason you'd wait is if you thought the price was gonna go up and you thought you could capitalize and game the market somehow that none of us can predict the future well enough to to probably do that right. The one thing I will say is when you think of a goal out there, um, 2030 coming, if you had never produced corn or soybeans before and none of your neighbors had, and somebody says, hey, I'm gonna pay you $10 a bushel for corn, $20 a bushel for soybeans if you start growing them, are you gonna be good at that in the first year? You're gonna make some mistakes, you know? So I think what we want to be careful of is that you get going on carbon, get engaged with it, start to figure out how to do it right, get some personal experience with it, so that when the prices are up, you're able to capitalize out on a grand scale. You know, so that's one element. Now you said, what's the size of the market? So how, how, how much are companies buying? Five Earths worth of agriculture. Okay. That's the demand. Five Earths, there's not enough land. So there is going to be a future demand for everything that agriculture can produce. And that demand, right now, the pricing is set by the forest availability. There's, let me give you an example. All the forest credits right now that are for sale, that could be for sale, that are in forests, they can offset the liquid natural gas cargoes that move around the globe in one year. That's it, okay. So now what, now what are you gonna do? Forest credits are gone. Agriculture, it's the next one, right? Soil carbon is this place where we can sequester vast majorities of carbon, but we cannot take care of the whole problem. We have to work with others. 
you know, again, five Earths worth of, uh, worth of demand. We have one Earth, and we need to be global first. We're talking about a portion of that in the U.S. here. Um, these credits are going to be in high demand. How do you measure a credit? Is it a certain amount of carbon in the land? And then what if you're doing a lot of this already, then you do a little bit more? Are you in the same position as someone who's done nothing and begins, like starts from a bad position and gets in a better position? You know, how does all that work? So the question really around um, your position, if you are uh, you know, starting off slow or you're, you're doing some, some of these practices are linear. You do a cover crop in one year, it's photosynthesizing. There's an amount of that that goes into the soil carbon. You do it in the second year, it's same. It's a linear trend, right? Others like no-till, it's slow. We, we know this, some of the no-till guys. First three years, I don't see a whole lot. Year four, year five, boy, I really start to see changes in the soil. That's the science behind it. We see the change. So on a, on a, on a practice like no-till, you might see less in the first three years and more. So getting going might be the first thing to do. Yeah, so the credit's based on the change. So the credit, let me go back for a second. A credit is loosely equivalent to a ton, a metric ton of carbon dioxide. This room is roughly a ton of carbon. If you, if you pulled out all the air and just filled this with carbon dioxide, this is about a ton in this room, okay? You're sequestering about this much per acre per year, all right? Um, a carbon credit is a little bit less than that because we have to do what we call a buffer pool holdback in case of reversals. It's, it's set up like an insurance policy, really, you know, where we have to hold back a piece in case some portion of a very large program undoes what they do. We haven't oversold, right? So that's, that's what we jointly do together, and that's a requirement of the registry. That's not something we do, right? That's, that's what makes it a registry-certified program that gives the buyers the confidence that these things are real. Got the green mic? Should be. Testing. There we go. On one of your earlier slides, you had the, like the five ways that agriculture can impact carbon. Can you just maybe talk about, a little bit about the relative size of impact of each of those? Yeah, sure. So r relative size and impact. Um, planting cover crops, significant. You know, and, and there's two aspects of carbon credits. There's abatement and sequestration. All right, you can get paid for abatement. I used to put down 200 pounds of N, I'm putting down 180, the difference, 20. That's abatement, you're, no, you're not using it. There's no chance of reversing it. If you can prove that I put 200 down last year and I put 180 down this year, you abated that, there's no reversal in it, right? So that, that's uh, rebalancing inputs, that's um, you know, a rotational crop, that's something that you would do in that particular year. Um, planting cover crops, that's, an annual piece, um, you know, you're, you're looking at somewhere about half a ton per acre for cover crops, tillage 0.1 to 0.3, rotation of crops, that's something completely different, but those are, those are sequestration credits. You know, you're looking at, I'm actually pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sticking it in the ground. We think there's actually going to be a price differential for that where industries are looking to undo the deeds of the past and say, I'm not just slowing down what's happening to our atmosphere, I'm reaching into the atmosphere and undoing something that happened in the past. So there's more value, we think, that'll come from the sequestration credits, and we're trying to very thoughtfully make sure that we keep all the value in there for every, anything that you might do. Um, incorporating livestock is the one that's dramatic. You know, We're talking five, six, seven tons per acre per year potential in out years of introducing animals back into agriculture. I've got a good friend over in Indiana, um, Brian Sutton, and Brian is, he doesn't call himself a regen farmer, he's just 400 acre farmer in, in, uh, in, Iowa, in Indiana, and he's um, done this, he's got Wagyu beef that he's growing on his ground with um, regenerative hay, and he's rotating crops, he's been no-till for 10 years and planting cover crops, growing his own cover crop seed. Um, he's, he's unfairly profitable 
relative to his neighbors is the right way to say it. And he goes around saying that. It's like, it's unfair farming for me. You know, I'm looking at what these guys are doing. It's unfair for me. He's 10 years into it. You know, so he's doing all of these, and he's seeing dramatic, um, dramatic changes and advantages economically and um, just you know, in, in terms of how he's utilizing the land and what he's able to do with a 400-acre operation, passing it on to the next generation even. So a lot of, a lot of really interesting opportunities around that. A question over here. The question that I have is that with uh, the lease or the, this goes with the land, um, that's signed by the landowner, the farmer itself, and then runs with the land itself, so therefore has an effect on sale in the future. So how is that lease worked out with uh, the farmer and then, and then with those? Yeah, it's a great question. So this is, this is one of the areas that as an industry, this is all emerging of how we navigate this because it's not just what you do in the year, it's what happens over the next several years, that storage, that permanence element, okay? So we want continuity, like that is the best outcome for agriculture, it's the best outcome for the planet, that if a, it, in 2020, a farmer comes in and does something, their lease runs out, the next year, landowner says, I don't want you on the land anymore, somebody else comes in, I want that next farmer, I want them doing carbon too. I want the landowner to be the continuity between that. I want the next lease to say, build on what started. I think you gotta work out the right sharing in the lease, the, the language in terms of what the grower gets, what the, the landowner might retain. We've set up this vesting schedule where you get, as I mentioned before, 50% of, of the carbon credit in the first year, 20 in year two, 10, 10, 10. You bail out on a program, we don't claw back, but we don't pay forward. So how do we incent that transition where you're going from one farmer to the next farmer on that year? Well, that farmer who's now no longer has access to that land loses the 50% out into the future. They got the 50% in year one, but they're losing access to that 50 unless that land stays in a regenerative move forward. So I, my recommendation would be to say to that landowner who was there, if you pass the data forward to the next tenant, and you're not a jerk about it, you didn't get the land, but hey, I'm gonna be nice, I'm gonna pass the data along, you get your 20%, 10, 10, 10 out. The grower who comes in in year two gets the 50% for that. If they stick around for three years, they're gonna get the 20, then the 50, then the 20, 20 out. Just figure out the right way to, to work it out. But I, I think ultimately, things that are socially reasonable and good people doing good things and, and thinking forward and passing the data, from a landowner perspective, you've got to think of this data as, as, as valuable as a soil fertility map and fertility of the soil. You know, having a data stream, having five years of record allows you to participate in a carbon program. Having that data and information pass with the land and you having access to that, super important. That, that's going to be key to be able to have choice of, of, of tenants on the ground as well. All right, we've got just a few minutes left. Any other questions? Yeah, back here. I'll get you next up here. Yeah, just a question on, if you said, uh, you know, when the gentleman here asked the score, the importance or the relevance of the five different activities, and you said incorporating livestock, five to six. Yeah. Explain that a little bit. What, what do you mean? I mean, that doesn't... Why? Mean? Yeah. Well, what, what you end up having is um, you have the, uh, the animal, if you're, if you're doing a... Um, if you're able to go through and say, this animal is able to um, forage on the stover, um, the the light traffic of the animal, the manure application, all of that comes into play. So if you're doing a, a proper rotational grazing uh, plan, that's, that's where this comes in, you know, and it just, it's just additive. The animals were part, if you, if you think back to the successful carbon, where the soils were at in grasslands with herds of buffalo, we're, we're headed back to that. So the, the closer you can get that back, the more chance that you have 
for an animal to do something rather than a microbe do it in the soil. I mean, what, what, right now, what you gotta think of in the soil, microbes are masters at turning carbon into carbon dioxide. You know, they're gonna take every bit of stalk, every bit of um, root mass, and they're gonna eat that. And they're gonna eat it, and they're gonna turn it into carbon dioxide. That's what we do, right? We eat stuff, we exhale carbon dioxide, and we inhale oxygen. That's exactly what microbes are doing in the soil. So if we can change that dynamic just a little bit, and if animals can help that with manure pulling out the carbon source, transforming it in the rumen, and uh, that's, that's an absolute win. Yeah, question up here. Yeah, so when you do these measurements and stuff like that, so the credits are adapted to, let's say you have higher performance or lower performance on your soil measures. How much of a delta have you seen with the measurements so far, what, what you've done, and how many years have you guys been doing that? Yeah, so we, we've, we're now in the second year of our program. Um, we've had long-term trials and tests. So one of, the, one of the things that's different in this world, and, and it's important, you know, most, I've been in a number of ag tech companies before, and it's always about your secret sauce. You know, we've got the secret model. We've got this thing that's better than everybody else. We can predict this better than someone else. In this world of carbon, that's absolutely useless that somebody has something private. It's got to be published in the open literature. It's got to be out there in the academics. That's what we really liked about Soil Metrics. Soil Metrics had 30,000 publications. It's just known globally as a verified, validated model that can. So we're, we're relying on the Rothamsted experiments in Germany, the Moro plots in Illinois, these long term experiments over hundreds of years. Um, Moro plots, I think 1880 was when it started. You've got these long-term experiments looking at the effects of, of carbon and looking and uh, setting up the trends with these models like soil metrics putting together. It's a 10,000 year uh, model run. So we model the grasslands all the way through. Then we model the last 50, 60 years of, of chemical agriculture. And then we model the change. And you're, you're looking at that trajectory and the slope of those lines and that's what's uh, ultimately giving you the carbon estimate. All right, yeah, back here. Oh, where the mic ended up. Oh, it's up here. Pass it down, guys. Yesterday at the uh, Farm Bureau Convention, the Secretary of Agriculture mentioned he'd like to see cover crops double in, in the next 10 years yeah. and uh, announced incentives through the EQIP program for it. How does your private model mesh with the public model? Oh, that's a great, great question. So private carbon programs, which is what I'm talking about here, they are ad sit adjacent to and match up with the government programs. One doesn't um, contaminate the other. They're both eligible. If, if you can do anything with a government program uh, that's an incentive to put out a cover crop, you can absolutely enroll in a carbon program. And I have lobbied and been very deliberate with the writers of, of that legislation, folks at USDA and others, to make sure these programs sit and, and growers can get and capture that value from both the government programs and the private programs. And they're very much behind that. They want to see this market flourish. They know that industry in general needs carbon credits to try to reach these, uh, reach these net zero goals that everyone set by 2030. So, um, yeah. Absolutely. So go after as much government funding as you can get and make sure at the same time you put that cover crop out, get into a carbon program because that's a way to get even more dollars from it. Great. All right. I think we're just at about time. Um, we have time for one more. Yeah. Yeah, one more. You talked about data, the digital harvest, the, the, the twin. What is what is the block of data that needs to get transferred? So the data uh, that we need in order to run the model and do the verifications is uh, two crop rotations back. So if you're corn and soy, that's four years back. Two rotations plus the year that you're in where the change happened. And what we need is planting date, uh, crop type, any nitrogen applications, any fertility applications, harvest, the, the harvest yield so that we know the biomass removal, how much came off the field. So it's, it's everything that's already out there. Um, and then evidence of the, the additionality thing. If you did cover crop, here's a picture of it. You know, and and we're, we're putting tools together 
right now that try to capture that data as near to the time of when it happened. So you're out in the field, driving with the tractor, planting, click the app and say, I'm in this field planting right now. That counts as evidence that, that meets the bar of all the uh, everything. So we're, we're trying to, you know, any, anything that's coming out of an electronic system, out of John Deere or out of Agco system or out of CASA system, those, ag, you know, AgVance on the backside of Ag Retail, any of those things work where you already have those recordings of it. Um, but it's two crop rotations back plus the year you're in. So that's, you know, from a landowner perspective, if you can capture five years of data back on a rolling basis going forward, that is going to be really valuable to the ultimate value of your land as you're participating in a carbon market. Good. Yeah, one in the back there. Minimum, minimum acreage for sign up. We, we had a minimum, I think it was 500 acres. And, you know, I've reduced that down now to just being two fields. I want to make sure it's not somebody with their backyard. You know, that's it. So it's just got to, you, you can get in with one field. We, we've run promotions on, on low number of fields. It feels like, you know, most operators are saying, I'm either all in, I'm going to make this transition on all my acres or, um, you know, something. But the, the acreage minimum is, you know, somewhere down in the less than 100 acres to participate. All right, well, hey, thanks everyone for your attention today and appreciate you coming out and um, looking forward to the rest of the day.